So today uh, we are starting with gypsum products and um, it's a big topic as you all know. So the next topic that is lined up for today is impression materials. Again, a huge topic as far as weightage of MCQs is concerned. The next important thing that we are going to be discussing here today is the setting, the setting reaction, right? The setting of gypsum products the setting of gypsum products which primarily essentially is nothing but the setting reaction that we are going to discuss about. So in common terms, it's the setting reaction and the various variables that are there that come in play, right? The third and important concept, these are the basic headings, right? Within which we are going to delve deeper, right? Um, then we have the setting expansion again a very important concept both from gypsum products chapter also and on sunday we are going to continue this with waxes and uh, investment material so there also it's very important so if we don't understand the basic gypsum chemistry and the setting expansion we are never going to be able to understand the bonding the the gypsum bonded investments and further further phosphate bonded investments and so on so setting expansion then we talk about the strength the strength of gypsum products, right? Then we are going to talk, we are obviously going to be talking about the classification or the various types of gypsum products. And finally, we are going to finish this topic with manipulation. How we store it, how we proportion it, how we mix it, right? In how much time we separate the the, the 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 poured impression material from the cast and finally how we disinfect it right so all of these things are extremely important both conceptually and from mcq point of view so let us start with the production of gypsum products friends uh, the first and foremost thing when we when we say gypsum you know this this creates a lot of conf confusion just like amalgam i'm not going to go much in detail because we've covered amalgam but there's a difference between amalgam alloy and amalgam amalgam is the set product so it's going to be containing silver tin copper zinc and mercury normally amalgam alloy does not contain mercury it's only when you mix it with mercury and the setting reaction takes place that you get the set amalgam right similarly gypsum gypsum products is what we are as dentists are interested in and what is found in nature as a natural ore as a natural mineral is gypsum. So what is gypsum? Gypsum is nothing but the dihydrate form. So it's the dihydrate form which chemically is calcium sulfate dihydrate. This is the set rigid three-dimensional product, right? What is in what is important for us is the gypsum product that is the powder form, the anhydrate anhydrate form, right? So how do we derive that? We heat it in a controlled environment at a particular temperature to drive off part of this water of crystallization, to drive off part of this water of crystallization to get a hemihydrate, right? So this is a dihydrate. If I am to heat it in an open container that's your mcq so this is an open container so i'll write it down simultaneously to get a gypsum product you heat the dihydrate that is the gypsum in an open container that's your mcq right for those of us who are attending the this this class of mine in uh, for the very first time this is how the basic model of teaching will be we'll be teaching the entire proper theory in a proper manner but ultimate aim is to solve mcqs and get your mds seat right so simultaneously we would be solving all the relevant mcqs calcium sulfate dihydrate you heat it now this is something couple of points which have to be memorized you heat it at 110 230 degrees celsius and that drives off part of the water of crystallization and what do you get you get your calcium sulfate hemihydrate so this is the hemihydrate this was the dihydrate 
and this is the hemihydrate, right? And that is actually the gypsum product which we are interested in getting. Now, if I am to add water to it, I start a reverse reaction, right? And that is what I do in my laboratory or in my clinic or in your colleges, you have this gypsum product, right? You have this calcium sulfate hemihydrate and you mix it in water, right? At the correct water powder ratio. And what you get is you go back to getting a rigid three dimensional cast or mold, right? And that is your gypsum, right? That's your set gypsum. So this is one thing that, that, that should not now no longer create any confusion. So if I am to add water to it, this reaction is reversed, right friends? This reaction is reversed. Now, just for your um, purpose of uh, theory knowledge, in general, this these hemihydrate forms or gypsum product are normally known as what? These are the dental plaster or stone. Dental plaster or stone. In general, based on their morphology and the fineness of the powder that is produced, they are further of five types, right? Those details we are going to be discussing towards the last section of this lecture. But basic difference, I must tell you here, in general, the plaster powder particles, the plaster powder particles are more spongy, number one, that's your number one MCQ. In other words, more irregular, right? Therefore, they require more water to get a uniform mix, right? So they require more water, which obviously implies that the water powder ratio would be more for the plaster, right? That's your impression plaster or your model plaster, right? And these are known as the beta particles, the beta form of the hemihydrate, right? That is your plaster. And if I am to see its position, the position of the plaster in the classification based on the type. So if I have the types of gypsum products, which I have say, for example, classified as type one, type two, then type one and type two are two different forms of plaster. This is just for the sake of completion. I'm telling you here better might as well just memorize these things simultaneously that's the that's the aim right type one is your impression plaster type two is your model plaster so just to generalize type one and type two are the beta forms right and when we talk about the stone stone is the alpha form it is when it's mixed with water because these are more regular in shape regular more properly you know prismatic in shape less spongy so they require less water they require less water to completely wet and get a nice homogeneous mix so the water powder ratio is less and obviously their strength properties are better. So the strength properties are better as compared to, to the beta form. What is the mnemonic? What is the way of memorizing this? Which one is alpha? Which one is beta? Alpha, you know, comes first before beta. Or in other words, when we say, you know, sometimes we, in common, common terms, we use alpha male or alpha. He's the alpha co counterpart, you can say, or the alpha component. Just a slang or a common way of referring to someone stronger, isn't it? Alpha comes before beta. So the, so the mnemonic or the simple way of memorizing this is that the alpha form of dental, um, uh, of the hemihydrate is the stone, right? Not the plaster. And the alpha forms are of the rest of the three types. So type three, four,
and 5 are the alpha forms. This is in short, just as a way of, you know, solving this, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, understanding this concept in totality, generalizing it while we are studying this, this, this reaction or this production of gypsum products. Okay, so let us just revise as to where were we in terms of our topic that we were discussing. We, was, we had started with the natural ore that is calcium sulfate dihydrate. We heated it in an open container to about 110 degrees Celsius to 130 degrees Celsius to get the calcium sulfate hemihydrate which is nothing but plaster or stone depending on the morphology of the powder particles you further heat it you further heat it to 130 degrees to 200 degrees celsius and you get a anhydrite that means you've driven off that half a molecule of water away also you've dried it to the extent because you've heated it to a greater temperature so what do you get you get a anhydrite which is basically a the shape of which is hexagonal now this is something that we have to memorize for our mcq perspective i further heat this hexagonal anhydride to up to 1000 degrees celsius that is from 200 degrees celsius to 1000 degrees celsius i get obviously now there is no 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 longer any water to be further driven off so i stay with calcium sulfate but it's just that the morphology or the shape will change to a orthorhombic shape so at 200 degrees celsius we got a hexagonal anhydride at up to 1000 degrees celsius we got get an ortho rhombic anhydride right um what is the mnemonic how do you memorize that at a lesser temperature of 200 degrees celsius we are talking of hexagonal and at a temperature of um, 1000 degrees celsius we are talking of orthorhombic so we are going from h2o hexagonal to orthorhombic so a way of memorizing is ho stands for head office right so first comes hexagonal then comes orthorhombic so we'll just write this down this is in this is a memory aid basically right so the mnemonic would be h o meaning head office right friends so this is how we can memorize this this is just a you know personal way you can make your own mnemonics this is how i remember this right friends all right so this was the production of gypsum products next important point that we are going to discuss here is the setting the setting reaction right so the setting of gypsum products now in this we primarily have we understand this concept um under three main headings right friends now listen to this very carefully this is important the first is obviously the setting reaction right and what are the various theories of setting reaction so first is setting reaction the second is quantifying the setting reaction meaning what is the mixing time working time and finally the setting time right so quantifying this setting reaction and third aspect that we discuss here is the control is the control how do you control the setting reaction that means how do you control the setting time right important mcqs come from all these three subheadings so first we take our setting reaction friends now in the setting reaction that means what are we talking about we're talking about the reaction or the hydration reaction of the hemihydrate to form the dihydrate so let us basically irrespective of which theory we are following let us see what exactly is happening first thing before 
you get further, you know, when you read your, go back and read your Phillips, you get confused. And if the examiner writes, I want to, I want to just clear one confusion. Hemihydrate is what? Calcium sulfate hemihydrate. So it can be written as calcium sulfate dot half H2O. Right? That's your classic calcium sulfate hemihydrate. It can also be written as calcium sulfate whole twice dot H2O. Basically, calcium sulfate hemihydrate means the ratio of calcium sulfate and water is 2 is to 1. Right? So, here calcium sulfate hemihydrate, the ratio is 1 upon 1 by 2, which is nothing but 2 is to 1. Here, calcium sulfate, whole twice, dot 1 water, again 2 is to 1. So, it can be represented in either manner. Please don't get confused when you go back to your textbooks. Why? Because the setting reaction is written in this second form. How? Calcium sulfate, you know, just for the sake of having, uh, not dealing in fractions. That is the only logic. Otherwise, it's the same. So, calcium sulfate, whole twice dot H2O, which is nothing but calcium sulfate hemihydrate, plus three molecules of water, would give us, again back, that is the reverse reaction, again we are go going back to the gypsum, the rigid three-dimensional natural ore that we actually, uh, you know, find in nature. So that would give us two full molecules of calcium sulfate dihydrate, right? Plus obviously some amount of unreacted uh, hemihydrate, which is all any, any chemical reaction you take, whether you're, you're dealing with GIC, zinc phosphate, amalgam, we've discussed this in the previous section. You know, the, the left-hand side reactant, the main reactant is never completely consumed. Some of it remains, right? In the set, uh, you know, in the set matrix. You can uh, imagine them equivalent to fillers of a composite. They provide strength to the set product, right? So unreacted left LHS, unreacted left-hand side components will always be there. So some portion of the unreacted hemihydrate and obviously heat would be generated. It's an exothermic reaction. So there would be generation of heat, right? So that's the basic setting reaction. Now the moot point or the, or the, or the, or the area of uh, controversy is there are three main mechanisms which have been put forth to understand the setting reaction of um, hemihydrate with water. Right. So the first theory is colloidal theory. What it says is that as soon as you mix hemihydrate with water, it enters into a soul state, colloidal soul state, just like agar and alginate. Soul state, soul is like a less viscous, more fluid state, suspension kind of a state, which obviously as the setting reaction products, uh, as a set setting reaction um, um, progresses, it gets converted into a three-dimensional rigid gel state. So colloidal theory simply says, it does not delve, uh, it does not, you know, go deeper into it. It just simply says that it's a soul gel transformation, right? That's what the colloidal theory, it's, uh, it, it says, right? Uh, again, it is not very, widely accepted. That's one. So it's not very widely accepted. What is the other theory? Other theory is simply the known as the hydration theory. The other theory is simply known as the hydration theory, friends. What does hydration theory says? That as these hemihydrate powder particles get hydrated with water, there is some form of hydrogen bonding between the sulfate groups of the hemihydrate powder particles and that is what helps in generation of a rigid, nice, solid, three-dimensional dihydrate. So, there is, between the sulfate groups, there is weak hydrogen bonding, hydrogen bonding. Right? Again, a theory not widely accepted. Mark my words, each and everything is an important MCQ. You can get a question simply 
a, a, a question of selection wherein they will ask you which amongst the following is the most accepted theory of uh, setting of gypsum products or which amongst the following is not considered one of the theories of setting uh, reaction of gypsum products. So you have to know all the three postulate postulated theories and you have to know which one is the most accepted, right? That is why I'm spending so much time here. So colloidal theory, one of the theories, yes. Is it widely accepted? No. Hydration theory, one of the theories, yes. Is it widely accepted? No. Then we move on to the main important theory that is known as the dissolution precipitation precipitation theory. Now this theory number one, number one MCQ, most widely accepted. Dissolution precipitation theory friends is the most widely accepted theory. That's number one point. Now let us see how this works out. What is it based on? That is important. I have my bowl and spatula in which I've dispensed my water and then I mix slowly sift my powder particles in the given water powder ratio, right? So this is my bowl, right? I have water inside, right? And I add my powder particles of my hemihydrate, right? Now, what the dissolution precipitation theory is based on, number one MCQ, it is based on the difference in solubility between the hemihydrate and dihydrate. And what is the what is the value of the difference in solubility? It says that the hemihydrate is four times more soluble than the dihydrate, which means that I'll keep on adding the hemihydrate powder particles till such time, obviously, till when can it be added? Till the time the solution, my water, that is my liquid, becomes saturated with my hemihydrate. Only till that time the hemihydrate will be added. Now what is happening is because the solubility of hemihydrate is four times more than the dihydrate. In other words, the solubility of dihydrate is four times less than the solubility of hemihydrate. Then as soon as the hydration of hemihydrate takes place, that is as soon as the dihydrate starts to form, because their solubility is less, they start to precipitate out. So basically your calcium sulfate hemihydrate when added in water leads to simultaneous precipitation out of your dihydrate crystals. And you get obviously because the dihydrate crystal is simultaneously precipitating out, you get more time there that you, you can add more hemihydrate. So it keeps on happening, you know till such time that all the most of the calcium sulfate hemihydrate is consumed and is converted into dihydrate. Right? So let us write down these very important points here. The salient points. Hemihydrate number one is four times more soluble than dihydrate. That's the basis of dissolution precipitation theory. Right? The other way in which the MCQ can be formed is what is the basis of dissolution precipitation theory? The difference in the solubility. The difference in the solubility of hemihydrate versus dihydrate. So let us just basically in short revise the setting reactions. We discussed the three most important points. Setting reaction number one. Uh, what is the setting reaction? Calcium sulfate hemihydrate with three molecules of water gives you two molecules of calcium sulfate dihydrate plus unreacted uh, powder particles of the hemihydrate with the generation of heat since it's an exothermic reaction. 
the first theory colloidal theory not accepted hydration theory not widely accepted the most accepted theory is our dissolution precipitation theory most widely accepted it is based on the difference in solubility between the hemihydrate and the dihydrate in which hemihydrate is four times more soluble than the dihydrate that's your mcq or in other words difference in solubility of hemihydrate versus dihydrate forms the basis of the dissolution precipitation theory simple the next important aspect of the setting of gypsum products is quantifying the setting reaction that's our important point quantifying the setting reaction important mcqs are going to be coming your way here so quantifying the setting reaction the first thing that we have to know is the mixing time right the mixing time now mixing time as you all know i'm not going to make you write the definition right you should just know the essence you should just just know the meaning right it's not a theory exam so nobody is going to ask you the definition mixing time is the time from the start of mixing till such time you're completing the mixing so that you get a nice homogeneous mix right simple so normally when we are doing hand mixing to get a nice uniform homogeneous mix uh, a, a mixing time of 1 minute is considered adequate or sufficient so when we are doing hand mixing one minute of mixing time is considered sufficient that's your mcq what if you're doing mechanical mixing mechanical mixing 30 seconds is considered adequate that's your next mcq what is the third mcq out of hand mixing and out of mechanical mixing which is preferred mechanical mixing under vacuum preferably under vacuum so that no air bubbles can be generated are generated right is the better out of the two so the third mcq that comes here is mechanical mixing under vacuum is the best method that's your next mcq right friends simple enough okay so this was with the mixing time then second is the working time now what is the working time working time is again the starting point is the same the moment you start the mixing but it goes up to the point where the consistency of the mix is such that it solves your intended purpose what do we mean by that i mixed what, what why am i mixing my gypsum product for i have to pour an impression so i have to mix it i have to have adequate time to completely pour the impression and then preferably i should also have some time left for the unset material which is still fluid enough to clean my equipment right that would give me adequate working time and that adequate working time for in general for all these types of gypsum products should be around 3 minutes that's your important mcq so what all are we doing in uh, working time we are doing the mixing part obviously we are pouring our impression and if we are duplicating you know you can say duplicating our cast we've taken two impression then at least we should be able to pour two impression isn't it whatever that depends on the clinical situation in general saying pouring the impression pouring the impression and thirdly cleaning the equipment and for that in general it is said that you should get 3 minutes you should get 3 minutes right so that's your important mcq here what is the next aspect of um 
the quantifying of the setting reaction. Then you have the setting time. Setting time is again right from the start of mix to the point where the where the setting setting or that or the setting reaction is completed. That is, you the, the product is now completely set. It has attained the rigid three-dimensional structure. Specifically for gypsum products, you know, if you talk about setting time of any other material, normally it's that one particular value except for say GIC which has the initial setting time and then they say that you know GIC keeps on setting because it basically keeps on maturing over the next you know three four days right that is what we discussed last time also if all of you remember that maturation of GIC takes place in which calcium is replaced with aluminium over the next you know you can say 24 hours to, to 72 hours but apart from that if we talk about in general setting then setting we just say that okay it's, this material has attained a rigid state it has set and that's it that's setting time specifically for gypsum there is this um, further division of the setting time into initial and final this is primarily just for academic purpose what we are interested in is the final isn't it i want my gypsum product to completely set into rigid gypsum so that I can separate my cast or mold from the impression surface without breaking it, right? But just for, you can say, um, academic purpose, there is an initial setting time also that has to be, uh, you know, that has to be understood. And that basically represents um, the loss of sheen or shine or the loss of gloss when you mix freshly you know you when you freshly mix powder and liquid powder and water then as the water of hydration is consumed right the sh natural shine of the fresh mix natural gloss of the fresh mix is no longer there right and that can be actually objective that's a subjective method right of the initial setting time so that is known as loss of gloss loss of gloss test that's just a very subjective way of you know the operator or the clinician just observing right that setting is progressing in the right direction and the other way of quantifying it is by you know subjecting the setting mass which is kept in the laboratory for example say on a glass slab and then impacting it impacting it or hitting it with a certain load like say a needle which has a particular weight and it drops down from a given height we don't have to memorize that right we just have to know the concept so that needle because we're talking of initial setting in which the gypsum has not attained its adequate compressive strength obviously by common sense we realize that that needle would be relatively lighter lighter in weight less in weight than the needle which is used to calculate the final setting time so this is known as the initial gilmore test initial gilmore needle test right we don't have to memorize the weight and the other specifications of the needle and the final set is obviously as you would by common sense understand that it's the it's the set it's the time after which you know the the uh, the the material has attained adequate compressive strength for it to be separated from the impression without the uh, without the fear of it breaking or cracking right and that in general is um, is when we have when the material has achieved around 80% of its final compressive strength right all right so that is quantified by the final gilmore needle test right friends now another important important point here is that in general this final setting time is achieved in about 30 minutes that's half an hour 
in general, approximately. Now, does this mean that uh, we can separate the cast from the impression surface in half an hour? No, we just add some 15 minutes to half an hour more as a safety net, right? Just to ensure that, you know, yes, adequate compressive strength is achieved. So if I'm to say that what is the final setting time roughly, that's 30 minutes, that's your MCQ. But the next MCQ is that after how much time would you separate the cast from the impression? That is about 45 minutes to 60 minutes. So that is after how much time of pouring. So the next MCQ is after how much time after you've poured the impression should you separate the cast from the impression or the mold impression or the mold cavity that is about 45 minutes to one hour that's 60 minutes right friends so the next time you've taken an impression in your clinic or in your posting and you've poured your impression wait for at least 45 minutes and then you separate it out right if i'm to see a graph of this quantification then let's see this this is an important graph given in your craig you can see here um craig says that roughly if you can see here roughly the ready to use criterion here just see this friends is this is the, this is this criterion right ready to use criterion see this and this roughly corresponds to around 30 minutes around what 30 minutes but that is according to craig which is in itself okay not completely incorrect why because as we said 30 minutes is the setting time final setting time more or less right wherein after 30 minutes around after 30 minutes you realize that most of the final compressive strength is achieved that is 80 percent or more of the compressive strength final compressive strength is achieved but philip says that we have to have that safety net so in case an mcq is asked and you have a better option 45 minutes to 60 minutes that is there you should mark that option over 30 minutes if 45 minutes to 60 minutes is not there then do not mark then we'll go for 30 minutes, right? So best possible answer is 45 minutes to 60 minutes. If that is not given, the second best answer is 30 minutes. This graph is not there in Phillips. This is this I've taken from Craig. And then we were talking about the, yeah, see here, the mixing time. We've discussed this. That's about one minute, right? Working time, that's about three minutes. Loss of gloss, right? is again a qualitative way of measuring the initial setting so that's about 11 minutes 11 to 12 minutes as you can see here initial gilmore is again very near to the loss of gloss that is again giving you an idea of the initial setting right so that is again somewhere around 12 to 14 minutes isn't it and uh, ycat test is another needle based test you can say which is again mentioned uh, in uh, Craig and that is more towards the initial setting time, right? So that is again somewhere around uh, 17 to 18 minutes, right? YCAT test. That is again um, another measure of setting time. Um, final Gilmore we've already discussed. Final Gilmore gives us a more closer picture of the final setting time. So it would be somewhere in the range of say near about 22, 23, 24 minutes, right? Right, friends? So this is basic idea in which we uh, quantify and get this, uh, this, this important value somewhere near to it, right? Obviously, depending on what gypsum product we're talking about, all these values are going to vary, whether it's type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, type 5. Don't have to go too much into details of these things, all right? I mean, if you have a basic idea, you are good to go. Right. So this was about the quantifying part of the gypsum products what is this was the second aspect so in quantifying the setting reactions we have discussed what all friends we have discussed the 
mixing time, working time and the setting time. Then, what is the next aspect? Right, setting of gypsum products, we've discussed setting reaction. We've discussed quantifying of the setting reaction in which we've discussed mixing time, working time, setting time and the various things within setting time initial and final, right? The third aspect that we are going to discuss is the most important aspect of this chapter. The control of setting time. How do you control it? How do you accelerate the reaction? How do you decelerate the reaction? Right? So, primarily, if I talk about in the control of setting time friends there are primarily three ways in which i can control one is if i am to control the solubility of the hemihydrate meaning if the hemihydrate is to go faster into the solution that is water obviously the dihydrate is going to precipitate out faster so the setting time so the setting reaction is accelerated means the setting time decreases i repeat Number one way in which we can control the setting time is the solubility. By controlling the solubility of the hemihydrate, right? That is, if I am to increase or decrease it. If I am to increase the solubility of the hemihydrate, then obviously the rate at which the speed at which the dihydrate is going to precipitate out will be faster, which means that my reaction would be accelerated, which means my setting time would decrease. The second way in which I can control the setting time is by the number of nuclei of crystallization. Controlling the number of nuclei of crystallization. What are these nuclei of crystallization? Nothing but calcium and sulfate ions. Right? These are the nuclei of crystallization which are going to crystallize and when hydrated they would form the gypsum. So, if I have more number of nuclei of crystallization, the faster they are going to interact with each other because they are closely spaced. So, the crystals are going to form faster. They are going to grow on each other faster. And faster I would achieve my final set. Faster I would achieve a, um, a rigid three-dimensional gypsum set product. Setting time would decrease. So, that's the other way of controlling my setting time. The third way is the rate of crystal growth. Rate of crystal growth. Again, essentially means the same thing. What is a crystal? dihydrate crystal which is forming. Rate of crystal growth again essentially means the same thing that is if I have more number of nuclei of crystallization per unit volume. That is when I have more nuclei density they are going to interact with each other faster because they are closer they are closer to each other so they would add on to each other the crystal length would increase faster right. Calcium sulfate dihydrate crystals, the gypsum crystals would add on to each other faster and they would entangle and intermesh with each other faster. In other words, make a nice rigid set product faster. Right friends? So these are the three ways in which I can control the setting time. Right? Now, these three ways can be controlled at two levels. One is by the manufacturer and the other is manipulation by the operator or the clinician. So, we further divide this into two ways. That is, 
all these three things can be manipulated at two levels. I'm speaking very slowly here because this is all concept based, right? But very interesting. One is by the manufacturer and the other is by the clinician or the operator. Now, how do you control the setting time? In other words, how do you control the above, above mentioned, above discussed three ways by the manufacturer? What if I am to, during manufacturer or manufacturing of my hemihydrate particles, if I just grind them, if I grind them and from one particle, I create multiple particles. If I create multiple particles, basically I'm creating a finer powder. That means more number of particles per unit area, per unit volume. That means, number one, they would dissolve faster in a given volume of water. If they dissolve faster, the precipitate of dihydrate would be faster. Second, I'm increasing the number of nuclei density. That means I'm increasing the number of calcium sulfate ions per unit volume. So they are interacting with each other, they're closely spaced. They are closer to each other, so the calcium sulfate dihydrate crystals will form faster. In other words, the reaction would be accelerated. In other words, the setting time would decrease. So by the manufacturer, number one, grinding of the hemihydrate powder particles would cause what? Would cause increase in the generation of number of powder particles, the finer, finer powder, powder particle size. Finer means smaller, right? Thinner powder particle size, which means these, these thinner powder particle size, number one, would go into solution faster, would go into the solution faster, right? This, which means dihydrate crystals will precipitate out faster, which means reaction would be accelerated, which means setting time is decreasing. The other implication is when I grind them, when I grind the powder particles, I am increasing the number of nuclei per unit volume. In other words, I am increasing the nuclei density. When I'm increasing the nuclei density, that means my generation of dihydrate crystals, that is precipitation out of dihydrate crystals is faster because they're more closely spaced, right? That means my reaction is accelerated, which implies that my setting time is faster, that is setting time decreases. Simple, right? The next way in which the manufacturer can manipulate the setting time, that is the first, that is the solubility of hemihydrate. What if there is another method in which I accelerate the speed with which the hemihydrates are going into the solution? That means I add accelerators or the other or the other way around in which I decelerate or retard the speed with which the hemihydrate particles are going into solution. That is a retarder. So addition of accelerators and retarders by the manufacturer will manipulate, will modify the solubility of hemihydrate, which would further lead to control of setting time based on whether I'm adding accelerators or retarders, right? So what are the most common accelerators? First is obviously we've done grinding by the manufacturer. Second is what, what the manufacturer can do. He can add accelerators or retarders. So accelerators, the most common is potassium, very important MCQ, potassium sulfate in a concentration greater than 2%. Number one MCQ, very important. 
second sodium sulfate but in a lesser concentration of up to 3.4 percent of up to 3.4 percent that's an accelerator right friends then we have in general sodium chloride that is also an accelerator you don't have to really memorize the concentration of that then very important borax is in general a retarder but in a concentration of very less that is less than 0.2 millimole in a concentration less than 0.2 millimole which is basically equal to about less than 0 0.08 grams per liter less than 0 0.08 grams per liter is an accelerator so this is very less otherwise in general please memorize this specific situation in which this concentration has to be very less then it is an accelerator borax or borate otherwise in general borates or borax is a retarder that's an mcq which brings me to the next mcq what all are in general retarders that is what all compounds when added reduce the speed with which the hemihydrates go into solution they are retarders and they are acetates borates citrates and the mnemonic is abc so retarders are a b c acetates borates and citrates so if not asked specifically borax is or borates are basically retarders but specifically in a concentration of which is very low that is less than 0.2 millimole which is equal to less than 0 0.08 grams per liter of solution they act as accelerators apart from that more commonly the mcq that is asked here is in terms of accelerators is potassium sulfate which in concentrations of greater than two percent is a very good and most commonly used accelerator right friends so these are the two ways two ways by which the manufacturer manipulates the solubility of hemihydrate right now let us look at the various ways in which we as clinicians can manipulate these three things the solubility of hemihydrate the number of nuclei of crystallization and the rate of crystal growth right so first is by manipulating number one what if i add in my original mix of my powder some uh, pre-reacted or pre-formed gypsum powder particles that is known as slurry water meaning when i'm mixing my hemihydrate that's my gypsum powder gypsum product powder like my dental stone or my plaster with water that water if it already has fine powder of set gypsum how do you get that that is known as slurry water how do you get that you get that by taking your cast you know your set cast which you've taken out from your impression and then putting it on the lathe and then collecting that water so that water would be consisting of finely divided dispersed gypsum powder particles and that is known as slurry water so if I'm to add my slurry water to my water, which I'm using for mixing my hemihydrate powder particles, what am I doing essentially? I'm increasing the number of calcium and sulfate ions. I'm increasing the nuclear density. So addition of slurry water effectively does what? Increases the nuclei density. When the nuclear density increases, that means the interaction of the calcium and sulfate ions is closer together is much faster that means the reaction is accelerated that means the setting time decreases that's one way in which i'm going to manipulate my setting time what is the other way mixing 
mixing time. As I said, what does basically mixing do? Mixing does what? As soon as you mix hemihydrate with water, calcium sulfate, because it has got very less solubility, starts to precipitate out. So when I'm continuously mixing for say 30 seconds, 40 seconds, one minute, two minute, basically what am I doing? I am breaking the newly forming gypsum powder particles, gypsum particles, and breaking them back into their constituent calcium and sulfate ions. So when I'm increasing my mixing time, I'm increasing the nuclear density. When I'm increasing the nuclear density, they are much closer together. So again, calcium sulfate forms faster. Calcium sulfate dihydrate forms faster. Setting reaction is accelerated. Setting time is decreased. So when I increase the mixing time, this implies that I'm increasing the nuclear density, which implies that my reaction takes place faster, which implies that my setting time decreases. Right, friends? Third, third way in which I can manipulate this is altering the water powder ratio. What is the water powder ratio in general? Um, the powder, when we talk about water powder ratio, one thing is clear, what we standardize the amount of powder, 200 grams, right? 100 grams over. So if I'm using, say, 45 ml, ml of water, so my water powder ratio becomes 0.45. That's one example. What if I'm using 60 ml of water for mixing the same amount of 100 grams of powder of my gypsum product. So my water powder ratio is 0 0.60. What does this mean? As my water powder ratio is increasing, right, my nuclear density is decreasing because for the same amount, for the same amount of powder, I'm using more amount of water, right? So the volume in which the same amount of powder is dispersed is greater. So my nuclear density is lessening. So this means when I'm increasing my water powder ratio, this implies that my nuclear density decreases. Right, friends? Now, if my nuclear density is decreasing, that means the individual calcium and sulfate ions are further apart. If they're further apart, then they interact with each other over a longer period of time. They take more time to finally get hydrated into, a, into the dihydrates and precipitate out because they're further apart. That means the reaction is decelerated or is slower, which means setting time increases. And obviously vice versa. If the water powder ratio is decreasing, nuclear, nuclear density is increasing, reaction is getting faster, setting time is decreasing, right? The important point here is to understand the table. Now, the, each and every point that I told you here, friends, was an important MCQ, all right? Each and every point. Now, in order to summarize this and take this in the correct perspective, we have to understand the table 9.1 given in your Phillips in your 12th edition. So let us just see what is written. Table 9.1, right? Given in your 12th edition in your Phillips. Let us first develop this table and develop the concept and solve the MCQs and then we'll, in totality, we'll see the table as a picture and analyze it, right? Just summarize the analysis. So let us write the water powder ratio. Let us write the mixing time. And obviously, let us finally write because we are interested in the setting time, right? So we write the setting time. So what if in one example, the water powder ratio is 0.45. It's increasing to 0.6, further increasing to 0.8. Right, friends? Mixing time, let us see. 0.5 minutes. This is in minutes. 0.5 minutes means 30 seconds, half a minute. 
one minute um, again we can say again 0.5 here then let us write um, one minute over here right and um, and just um, let's just do one thing we can um, yeah so point um, five let's write one minute over here so you will just analyze this. this is very interesting so point 0.5 mixing time 0.45 water powder ratio then uh, one minute mixing time over here well, let's keep the water powder ratio here the same 0.45 all right one minute and 0.6 okay let's see this friends see if I am to see the effect of mixing time on the setting time, the other variable has to be kept constant. Otherwise, there will be bias. Simple. So, I will tell you how to understand this. This is very simple here. See, I am increasing my mixing time from 0.5 to 1 minute. Right? And I have to ensure simultaneously that my water powder ratio has to stay constant because I'm comparing only the mixing time if I see if I'm to see the effect of one thing on the setting time I have to ensure that my other variable is constant otherwise how would I know which is causing what you understand if I'm to vary mixing time and water powder ratio both and then see the net effect on setting time then obviously I will not know whether mixing time is causing that effect or water powder ratio is causing that effect, right? So the idea here is to understand the effect of mixing time on the setting time when the water powder ratio is constant and when we are analyzing the water powder ratio, trying to understand the effect of varying, the effect of varying the water powder ratio when the mixing time is kept constant, right? So let's see, let us summarize what we just discussed mixing time in minutes when i'm increasing it 0.5 minutes to one minute meaning i'm increasing the time during which i'm spatulating meaning that i'm increasing the number of nuclear density how by breaking up the newly forming gypsum particles the nuclear density that is the calcium and sulfate ions increase they are closer together because the nuclear density is increasing number of nuclei per unit volume is increasing that means the reaction takes place faster the precipitation they interact because they are closer to each other they'll interact faster so they'll precipitate out faster right so let us just see the data here if i am to see this value so from 0.5 to one minute for the same water powder ratio the value is setting time is decreasing from 5.25 to 3.25 which is understood because the reaction is getting faster so the time is decreasing this is what we assessed this is what we analyzed right now let us look at the other aspect water powder ratio so let's see if i am increasing my water powder ratio from 0.45 to 0.6 meaning that now my increase in water powder ratio right means the powder particles are less water is more means my nuclear density is decreasing when my nuclear density is decreasing means my calcium and sulfate ions are farther apart means it will take more time for them to come together hydrate and precipitate out so the setting time will increase so let's see the data from 0.45 to 0.6 for the same mixing time the value increases from 3.5 3.25 to 7.25 from 3.25 to 7.25 and this is what we assessed right i'm repeating this again here see this here very interesting when I'm increasing my water powder ratio from 0.45 to 0.6, meaning my water is more, powder is less. My density, nuclear density is less. They are farther apart. They'll take more time to come together and precipitate out. Means my reaction is slower. Means my setting time will be, will take more time. So setting time would be increasing. Right? 
So this is the essence of table 9.1. This is the master. See, this is the trend that we are going to follow when we are going to see the effect of mixing time, water powder ratio, uh, on setting time, setting expansion and comp compressive strength. This is how, this is that one, you know, one basic mechanism by which we understand the entire topic of gypsum products. These are the two main things, right? See, manufacturer is manipulating things which we can't control. If he's generating, if he's, you know, increasing the number of powder particles, decreasing the size of the powder particles by grind, grinding them, I cannot control that. If he's adding accelerators and re retarders in a given ratio, I cannot control that. That is the product that I have got. If I have to further manipulate the mixing, the, 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 the setting time, the expansion, the strength, then what, what are the two basic things I can, I can alter? They are water powder ratio and mixing time. And these two are going to be having the effect on the setting time, setting expansion, compressive strength. So this is the basic model by which all the tables in your chapter of Phillips are made. Right, friends? So this is how we develop the concept here. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. So we've discussed, what all have we discussed here? In the setting of gypsum products, we've discussed the setting reaction. We've discussed the quantifying of the setting reaction in which we've discussed all the MCQs pertaining to mixing time, working time, setting time. And we have discussed the control of setting time in which we've discussed the various ways it can be done and how and at what level it is done by the manufacturer level at the level of the operator.